Okay, it's seven o'clock. Um, I'd entertain a motion to open. Motion open. Second. Second. <laughs> Roll call vote, Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Uh, Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby, yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Tracy Blaze, Town Administrator. Yes. Julie O'Brien, Executive Administrator. Yes. Arthur Taylor, Planning Director. Yes. John Lucy, Chief of Police. Yes. Anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. Brian Colloran, Conservation Commission Chair. Let's see, I think he'll be joining. Brian Forget, Brighton Superintendent. Yeah. I see we have. Yep, we got you now, Brian. Maureen Heffernan, Triton School Committee. Yes, I'm here. Paul Mayette, Triton School Committee. Yes, I'm here. Paul Goldner, Triton School Committee. Yes. Uh, Kyle Warren, Triton School Business Official. Yes. Good evening. This open meeting of the Newbury Select Board is being conducted virtually, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 in the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. The order, which you can find posted on the town's website, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely. So access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Newbury Select Board is convening by Zoom meeting link as posted on the agenda on the town's website. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the website and we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on the website. We're now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will go down the line of board members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or questions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and be sure to state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in dialogue with other members, please do, throw, do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. The chairperson, a vice chairperson, will afford the public comment for a period of three minutes and it will be granted as follows. Participation will be sought through the raise hand function. For video conference participants, this function can be accessed by clicking on the participants option listed in the menu below the photo gallery. Have your cursor in this area if you don't see it. Participants window will open and display on the right. On the bottom of this participant area, you will see a list of the phone and video participants. And on the bottom, you will see the ability to click on a button to raise hand. Please ensure your name is displayed. You may rename by using the more function next to your name. Telephone participants can use their phone's keypad while in a Zoom meeting to raise hand by hitting star nine. Those who have requested to be heard through the raise hand function will be heard in the order of which they are listed. The system lists in order by whom first hit the raise hand function. Please identify yourself by stating your name and address and then your question or comment. You will be unmuted and your hand will be lowered when you have been giving the floor for your questions. We will continue down the list of those in the raise hand column. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Okay, uh, communications from citizens. Do we have any raised hands, Tracy? You're on mute, Tracy. I do, Mr. Chairman. Bob Connors would like to be recognized. Uh, yes. Uh, Hey, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the select board. My name is Bob Connors of 39 Annapolis Way, Newbury. Uh, I just wanted to uh, offer some comments about a proposal that is before your board tonight. Uh, 
at the request of several Plum Island residents and wanted to share concerns by the residents regarding this $7,500 proposal to monitor Plum Island birds. In the past, several property owners have complained about trespass onto private property, erecting symbolic fencing and signage, declaring property closed without seeking or granting or getting authorized written permission uh, by individual property owners, submittal of certificates of insurance and hold harmless agreements in case whatever has been erected uh, causes injury to others. Uh, and it, it's been a great concern and, and I know several have complained uh, to the town or, or shared their concerns, I should say. Uh, if the town goes forward with this proposal, it would seem to me that the uh, the work would be performed as an agent of the town. And I think it would, would add some unnecessary liability and, and angst uh, for the town. Um, I'll be honest with you, the residents feel that if there's $7,500 available in the town coffers, that it would be better spent uh, maintaining the right of ways uh, emergency right of ways after storm events to provide beach access to various parts of the beach. So I just wanted to share that concern. Uh, it, we typically haven't had any problems in the past, but uh, it, it, it caught a lot of attention last year and uh, certainly the concern about private property and being treated uh, as other than private property uh, was a concern. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, the rest of the board, uh, for allowing me to share this uh, concern. Absolutely. Um, thanks for sharing, Bob, and uh, we'll keep that information in mind as we uh, take the topic up later tonight. Okay. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, uh, Stephen Mangin would like to speak. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Hi, Steve. I I have three things very briefly. One, I commend the board that you're having this thing called Citizens Concerns. I think it's a good way for people to voice some information to the select board. Uh, number two, I'm hoping that, though it can be difficult, I'm hoping that the board can find a way to go back to having monthly meetings with one of the members of the board and the public, say for an hour. I recognize that there are some logistical issues and attendance issues, but I encourage you to seek out doing this again. Uh, thirdly, this is about a future issue that might be coming down the road, uh, which I think you'll have to be taking some votes on regarding the operation of the newly proposed Plum Island restaurant, which is going to be about 150 outdoor seating. And the last time the planning board met, they were the applicants were talking about, maybe we can reopen from 9 a.m. to midnight. When the time comes, I suggest that that's gonna be an excessive amount of time to have 100, up to 100 people outside till midnight and perhaps having alcohol, which gets me to how I hope that when the time comes for an alcohol license, which again, I don't have a problem with per se, but alcohol consumption is not allowed outside, but only inside the building. Well, those are my three items, and I thank you for the opportunity to make this as a citizen's concern. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, Tracy, do we have any other raised hands? Uh, I see Leslie Matthews has raised her hand. Leslie? I think she's on mute. She's going to be unmuted. Hi. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I, when uh, Chief Lucy comes up, uh, I was wondering if he was going to update us on the <clears throat> the new regional group um, for our area as far as uh, ramping up the COVID vaccines and if uh, um, administration administrator Blaze administrator Blaze would bring us up to date on the. Um, call that was put in on Thursday with the surrounding areas uh, leaders. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Okay, do we have any other raised hands? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to 
chairman's report. I signed the PR 21-18 for Julie O'Brien, and I also signed the PR 21-18 for the select board. And um, we're gonna have a long meeting tonight for all of your help in uh, moving the meeting along and expedite this in a fairly timely fashion. I imagine we'll be three hours getting through it all somehow, but if I could get help in getting through tonight so I can get our people out of here and home safe, that would be wonderful. So under grants, gifts, and donations, we have a $25 COA donation from Susan Ricker. Uh, is there a motion? Motion to accept. Second. Uh, Alicia Greco? Yes. Michael Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby, yes. We have a Commonwealth of Massachusetts selection of the town of Newbury to participate in the Cybersecurity Awareness Grant Program. Motion to accept. Second. Uh, Alicia Greco. Do we want to have dis discussion first? Hello. Sure. Yeah. Uh, can Tracy, can you explain a little bit to the, the people that are listening what this is? So uh, this is the second year that we have been um, awarded the opportunity to participate in cyber awareness training through the Commonwealth of Mass. Basically what they do is they allow um, the town to um be part of their training that they will provide to all of the employees as most of us know at this point stage of the game the employees are definitely our front line to protecting the town from those types of threats so um they are we're given tests actually periodically we're sent emails you know saying click on this and then at the end of the exercise we're all graded so last year we did pretty well um, we were up in the high 80s I'm happy to report um, so we're hoping each year as we do our in-house training um, we'll cert certainly work towards improving that grade. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does it cost Sorry. anything? No we got the grant so it's free for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, no public hearings tonight. Uh, gonna, move to vote, we're, Chairman we're gonna vote. Colby. Uh, gonna vote. Okay. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby? Yes. We have some business licenses to move. Uh, we have David and Carol Dempsey, DBA Plum Island Kitchen, 134 Northern Boulevard, Common Vic. Motion to accept. Second. Uh, roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby? Yes. Um, Raina Bonfa, DBA Walk My Paws, 90 Newburyport Turnpike, Dog Training and Dog Play Care. Motion to accept. Second. Any discussion? Um, roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby? Yes. I would need a vote to allow the chair to sign business licenses. There's, there's two more, what, is there two more Do things? Do we skip those others? We'll skip yeah. a couple things. Uh, roots to wings and yep, storage sorry. Self -storage. They, they didn't come through on my cover sheet. Did somebody pick up if you got them tabbed right off the... Sure. Um, go right to it. Yep. Um, Elizabeth and Michael Houlihan, DBA Roots to Wings, 76 Newburyport Turnpike, General Business, Health and Wellness. Movement, motion to accept. Second. Roll discussion. Call. Oh, any yep. discussion? Yep. Roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. <clears throat> Jerry Colby? Yes. And and what else do we have, Alicia? Brandon Kelly, DBA Store Yourself. Storage, 12 can't wait, general business, self-storage. Motion to accept. Second. Discussion. Uh, roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby? Yes. Make a motion to allow the chair to sign the licenses. Second. Uh, roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby? Yes. 
Uh, we have an appointment to the Board of Registrars, Douglas Coleman, term April 1st, 2021 to March 31st, 2024. Motion to accept. Second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call vote, Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby, yes. We have some commercial clam license applications for 2021-2022 listed. Excuse me, JR, before you move on to that, could you do um, allow the chair to sign the appointment slip in the town clerk form for that appointment? Yes, um, we would need permission for the chair to sign. Motion for the right. chair to sign. Second. Any discussion? Uh, roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby? Yes. And we have some commercial claim license applications. There are two on here that are pending. And what I'm told is we will, those will be approved tonight um, pending the town clerk receiving the rest of information. Because of COVID, there have been some delays. And that seems to be the reason for the hold up on these two. Um, I am going to recuse from the seven Colby's on here, even though there isn't a close direct relation. Um, I'm going to recuse on those names. So I will ask, uh, the vice chair to take up those once I get to Tim Castine. So would you like to, I guess we'll take them one by one. It seems the safer, uh, we got Kyle Adams, Frank Bennett. If anyone has a hold on any of these, just say hold. Uh, Peter Britz, Jennifer Brown, pending. Uh, Kaylee Burke, Gus Campitelli, Tim Castine. Ben Colby, Charles Colby, Charles A. Colby Jr., Gavin Colby, Laura Colby, Mason Colby, Robert Colby. And we have Neil Conley. Everett Davis Jr., Jay Dodge, Joshua Dodge, David Elwell, Doug Foley, Zach Fournier, Robert A. Fournier, Fred Hoistat, Jeff Janvren, Cole Lojek, Neil Lojek, Ross Lojek, Alexander Maxson, Noah Merrill, Peter Morin, David Morse, Cody Nixon, Corey Nixon, Michael Nixon, William Papulius, Thomas Savage, John Short, William J. Short, John Thistlewood III, Peter Thistlewood, Jeffrey Thurlow, Jim Welch, Tim West, Thomas White, Jacob Wood, Stephen Wood. Um, could I have a motion for all of these licenses that are not Colby? Motion that. <laughs> There's a second one that's pending. Which one did you? That that was Jennifer Brown, and it, what, what I was told when I inquired about this is basically the waiting on, a, I believe, a license number, which she expects to receive, and it's just because of COVID delays. So after our, that's the only one? There's not two pending, there's just one? Yes, and okay. also Jeff, Jeff Janvren, but he'll, you know, he'll have his in. He's a regular. He's always, he's there every year. So I believe these are just processing delays. It is. The, uh, the Gloucester office is closed, so it's been taking a little longer to process. And Leslie confirmed um, that the town clerk, that she wouldn't process the license, the actual official license, until she had the number from the state. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we had a motion on all the ones I am not recusing from. And I will move to a roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Michael Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby, yes. I'm going to recuse myself from the uh, that the vice chair is about to read off. So could I have a motion to approve the uh, Colby names that I've I've read off? Mo motion to approve the Colbys. Second. Uh, roll call vote. Um, Mike Doyle? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. Geraldine Heavey? Yes. Alicia Greco? Yes. Thank you, Alicia. You're welcome. I would need a vote to allow the chair to sign the ones I haven't recused from, and I will need 
um, somebody to stop in and sign the others. I guess I'll I, can, be able to I can stop in tomorrow after work if you want. Okay, that works. Okay. Okay, so let's take that separate. So I move that the chairman come. Uh, uh, I move that the chairman sign the um, the clam licenses that we just approved. I'll second that. Read by him. Okay. Um, uh, roll call vote. Alicia Greco. Yes. Mike Doyle. Yes. Jerry Heavey. Yes. Jeff Walker. Now you would need a, a motion to allow Mike to sign the uh, remaining. So I need a motion to have Mike Doyle come in and sign the remaining uh, light clan licenses from the Colby's. So moved. And a second. Second. Uh, a roll call vote. Uh, Mike Doyle. Yes. Jeff Walker. Yes. Jerry Heavey. Yes. Alicia Greco. Yes. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Okay, Mass Audubon Coastal Waterbird Management Agreement Renewal. Um, how long have we been engaging in this agreement, Tracy? Do you know off the top of your head? Yes, uh, two seasons. This would be the third season if approved. Okay, and I would be open to any discussion on this before the vote. Um, can I have a question, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, Tracy, has the town received um, emails in favor and or against these? Um, I have received a couple of um, emails relative to concerns about it um, going on private property and uh, Audubon themselves received some positive feedback about the work they were doing, so. And can you explain exactly what the town is, what uh, Audubon is proposing to contract with the town? This is not for private property. It's not all of the beach, correct? Correct. Um, basically in exhibit A of the doc document, they provide a description of services, but it's primarily um, monitoring um, cordoning off the areas where they find um, the birds. Um, and those types of things, like education, letting property owners, beachgoers know about the plovers and those types of things. I know um, in the last couple of years, I've had folks reach out to me um, about it. Um, mostly residents in that area um, have awakened to find people roping off sections of their backyard, erecting signs, uh, without their permission. Um, I know there's some type of appeals process. They could contact Audubon saying they wish, you know, this practice to be discontinued in their backyard um, to no avail. So this hasn't been without problems. Um, so I, I have another question, Chairman Colby. Yes, um, does, does, if the town does not, uh, if the select board votes to not engage in this service by Mass Audubon this year, does mm -hmm. that prohibit any um, private residents, private, you know, private residents, any somebody that already that wants to do this on the beach that wants to engage with that, does that prohibit them from working with Mass Audubon? I wouldn't believe so. No. Oh uh, yeah, I wouldn't think so because it's private private property. Mike. Um, they've all, they already rope off almost 80% of the beach from the, you know, from the reservation down. Um, <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm, my, my concern is, my concern is if, if they, if they're going to come into the private section of the beach, I mean, it's, it's like, they've got enough. My, the only concern I have is what if a piping plover nest in front of one of somebody's, one of the, one of the dunes that's being enriched. Is that, a, I mean, it, can they block them off then or? Can we just let them have the other 80% of the beach for six months of the year? I'm not, I don't, I'm asking. Yeah, that, I don't know the answer to that question. Jeff? I think, um, believe it or not, I think Mike encapsulated that pretty well. I mean, plovers have the whole of the refuge and they're highly protected because they close the refuge off. Um, the amount of plovers that have been seen on Plum Island 
have not been that many. The cost of the project has gone up and I think Audubon, if they had stayed up on the other side, you know, it would have been a comfortable conversation, but you know, it would be the same as the town hiring people to walk all over your property, you know, of anyone else that owns a piece of property and erect fences. So even though there's a lot of use on the beach. So I'm not particularly for this either. Um, I think that it would be kind of, it's, it's just overkill. Jerry? Um, what, what season um, is this impacting? Is it in the height of uh, the summer or early spring? It's, it's basically, and don't hold me, Jerry, to exactly the beginning of it, but it is the beginning of warmer weather, which is usually in that end of May, June. And I think, John, when does the uh, refuge actually open up their beach again? Is it late August? Yeah, well, the, the area, the, the time frame that's pretty consistent is exactly as you said. It's in the spring uh, when it just starts to get warm, and, and it's not inconsistent for it to get into like mid June when they start backing it off, uh, when they start uh, fledging or you know whatever birds do when they're when they're ready to <laughs> to move on. Um, but uh, so that's you. That's about the time frame. When when I was reading this, you know, description of services. It's funny, I just assumed that this was not on per, uh, personal private property. So I'm, I'm a little surprised that people can do this. So um, I'm, I'm really not, I'm not a, a, a fawn. I like the birds, but I think people have the right to privacy and not have people erect things on their property. Thank hey, you. Any other comments from the board before we move to a vote? Um, I would entertain a motion. Motion to vote on this this article. Um, um, folk, folk, probably a motion not to renew the agreement with the okay, uh, that, 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 okay, yeah. postal thing. Okay. Is there a second? Second, second that. that. <laughs> right. roll, roll call vote. Alicia Greco. Yes. Mike Doyle. Yes. Jerry Heavey. Yes. Jeff Walker. Yes. And J.R. Colby. Yes. Okay, um, we have a, oh, sorry. Geez, Brian, you almost got stuck here for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, your, and your good school committee members. Um, okay, we have a Triton budget question and answer session with Brian uh, Forget and Arissa Wallen. And we're also joined by uh, Paul Mayette and Paul Goldner tonight from Newbury School Committee and Maureen Heffernan. Well, am I, am I kicking this off? So thank you, Mr. Chairman and other members of the select board. Um, so as you mentioned, we have uh, two of the three Pauls from the school committee, Paul Mayette and Paul Goldner, as well as Maureen Heffern in the vice chair. Um, and then Kyle Warren is with me as well, the business administrator. So uh, several of you have been um, part of other meetings, DCC meetings, president budget meetings. So I certainly don't want to, it sounds like you have a packed agenda tonight. So I certainly don't want to repeat things that the majority of you have heard, but um, I think the, the the hope was to have us here. And are there any questions? About the budget? Um, I can give you the thirty second summary of the budget as a starting prime, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why don't we do that? Okay. Um, I should also say, you know, the million dollar question. Everyone's talking about uh, students returning to schools. Just to confirm, Governor uh, uh, Commissioner announced about a week ago. Maybe, a vote on Friday and uh, the commissioner released guidance today uh, requiring that we start that shift as of April uh, 5th. So um, school committee is taking that up again tomorrow night. I'm not going to say anything, right? This is still a work in progress. Lots of discussion still to be had, uh, but we know we'll be starting that transition at least elementary. Um, I should say elementary needs to be full in by April 5th. Um, and then uh, whether it's a transition or all at once, committee will have that discussion tomorrow night, look to the following week, a week from tomorrow night, uh, to actually vote on a written plan um, and to have that in writing so that everyone is clear about what the vote is, uh, what the vote means, um, and then uh, take action from there. So um, that's that piece. That's obviously been what we've been doing this year, trying to figure out how to get students back and it's obviously been challenging like like everyone else across the table in the world. Um, so the budget for 
this 22 next year, the 21, 22 school year um, was uh, it's obviously we finalized the current year's budget before we closed everything down. So this budget actually assumes the numbers uh, that we actually had for the fiscal 21 budget. Obviously everything changed. We have a remote academy with close to 300 students in it with students um, and teachers outside of school. We have increased staffing, we have savings in other areas. So this year's budget is not, um, or this year's enrollment is not uh, something we could predicate a, a spending plan on for next year. So this makes the assumption that we return to our normal staffing and student levels um, for next year. So other than um, that, this is a level services budget, which means we're taking the cost of what it uh, is to do business um, in a normal year and carrying that forward into next year. Salary contracts, step and scale, uh, health insurance, uh, utility. Um, there are within the, the budget, the general fund budget, um, there are three additions. Um, there is the second of three years of funding for full day kindergarten. So we took this as a three year phased approach. $225,000 was collected annually in tuition. Kindergarten tuition was $2,950, call it $3,000. Last year or the current, uh, last year we, uh, the committee funded the budget or the towns funded the budget, I should say at 75,000 um, added money that brought the tuition, what would have been this year, had we had a normal year to 2000. An additional 75,000 is included in this budget. That brings the kindergarten tuition to 1,000 for next year for families. We continue that pace and in the fiscal 23 budget add an additional 75,000, that's the, the final increase. We then, as of September of 22, uh, will have universal free full day kindergarten. Um, we are one of a very few handful of uh, communities across the Commonwealth now that are not offering a free universal full day K uh, the decision was to take this in manageable chunks um, rather than have it be forced because there's been discussion about legislation that would require this. So rather than getting caught with a $225,000 increase in one year, uh, this is a three year phase in. So that year two phase is included in this budget. Um, also includes $100,000 for new special education programming. We have this discussion each year, the increased costs of special education. Um, we have uh, between three and four students that meet a certain criteria, pretty, pretty substantial uh, needs. Um, we, I can tell you that the cost of one of those students with outside uh, tuition plus transportation would likely be more costly than this $100,000 increase. And what this does is this, uh, this keeps those students in our district, um, in our schools, and uh, for a much more affordable rate. Um, but also it's the right thing to do to keep our students within the school. So we actually had a program dissolve um, two years ago. We had a um, 18 to 22 significantly medically fragile students. Um, so this is building a new program, not exactly that same um, level of disability, uh, but it's at that, that early, um, early elementary age. And so then this program would likely grow and follow those students throughout their, uh, their tenure in the schools through age 22. And then the one other position that was added in this budget is a technology support. So we added a thousand devices uh, to our repertoire um, for remote learning. We have a one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative for all students. Uh, the first at least two years of that is funded through uh, federal stimulus COVID relief funding. Um, but with that came uh, quite a bit of necessary support. So we um, were able to add an additional person, tweak some existing positions this year, and this add an additional person next year. So we have okay. one person at each school. Um, the logical question is, well, we're not gonna have remote learning next year, Brian, why do we still need all those devices? Um, I think it's, if you talk to educators, this one of the silver linings is this has changed the way we educate students. So teachers have found new ways of engaging, engaging students with technology. Right now, that largely means when they're home, they're on a screen. Uh, but that, so this doesn't mean that when they're back in the classrooms, they're sitting on a, on a screen for, uh, for six hours a day. Um, but there are ways uh, to utilize that technology that will advance uh, the learning that they do in person with teachers, because we know this is about um, 
students and teachers in the room together, but technology is, a, is an important tool and we've uh, increased our dependency on that this year. So those three positions, so again, the full day K, special education position, the technician are included in the general fund budget. Um, also in the budget, it outlines all of the um, federal stimulus money that we have received last year into this year and going into next year. Um, there is obviously the $1.9 trillion new federal stimulus. We, we have lots of assumptions and uh, projections about what that means for, for cities and towns and directly to schools. There's no calculation in this budget for that, um, as we don't yet know what the, the exact figure will be. So there are um, a couple other things that we had talked about throughout the, the past two months with the budget development um, that were high needs and ultimately ended up in that pandemic funding. Um, so the first is a, um, an updated curriculum. It's a $42,000 curriculum. It's actually the online version of our math and focus program, K through six, pretty straightforward. Uh, that's a one-time cost. You should say that these are assumed one-time costs or one time that may develop into long-term costs. Um, we have a health and wellness coordinator in services uh, that was discussed pretty extensively. Um, we know that based on the last year, um, on, any, on any given year, we had uh, new health and wellness curriculum. The, the current state standards are from 1999. Um, a lot has changed in the last 22 years. And so we've been preparing to adjust to those um, they, we don't have those new standards yet. So there's definitely work that existed pre-pandemic, but we know that just the overall social, emotional, and mental health and well-being of our students coming back into the building after many of them being very isolated over the last year is, is a huge need. That is nationally across the state, across the world. So uh, this position actually is focused as a coordinator to start that work. And we envision this moving from coordination into actual services, actual interventions for students. And then if this does become funding that we need um, into the future, it would become part of a future budget discussion. So for now, that's one-time funding. Um, we've allocated up to $200,000 just for the summer um, for mitigating learning loss. That will be um, extensive, and I would say intensive, uh, to some degree, uh, learning for students across the board. We have a special education summer program that happens every year. This is not the special ed summer programming. This is extensive. We're looking at 100 and 150 students um, per school, um, and it would range from remote learning to in-person learning to week-long intensives. Um, at the high school level, it would be um, entire courses that might be over a two week period, an intensive course uh, for students who weren't able to get their credit. Um, obviously at the high school level, uh, the stakes are a lot higher as you're getting credit for courses versus learning loss at a second grade or third grade that we have some years uh, to help mitigate that loss. So that is certainly one-time funding. We see that starting in the summer and likely uh, morphing into next school year. Um, so those are, yeah, so those three. So the curriculum, the health and wellness coordinator, and the, uh, that summer mitigation are included. And just so some of you are around the DCC table or listening to the school committee meetings, those were all um, extensively discussed, but ultimately they landed uh, into, the, um, into the, the ESSER funding, so, or the federal funding. So, so ultimately it's a, it's a 2.84, sorry, maybe glasses. It's a 2.84% increase in our overall spending. Um, that translates to a 3.87% increase to local member assessments in the aggregate. Um, this is a discussion, this is my 16th year in central office. So this is the 16th year we've had this discussion, how the state is stepping away from their responsibility. So uh, the increase in our assessment is entirely borne um, on the backs of our member towns. This year we're flat for um, uh, chapter 70 literally getting back to where we should have been this year. So they're literally all increases plus uh, an assumption of um, some loss of uh, regional transportation um, that is ends up being born in the back of the town. So, so ultimately it's a, a $1.26 million increase. It's a 1.33, I'm sorry, $1.26 million increase um, and a $1.33 million increase to the towns. Um, we also had a, a swing in enrollment um, and so that actually 
because of the pandemic, um, we had about 167 students who left the district, um, homeschooled, private schooled, um, you name it. Uh, those they were looking for more in-person learning. Those who I've spoken with, largely we expect all of those uh, families to be returning and students to be returning. Um, one particular example is in Rowley. There's a, there's a private school in Rowley uh, that gives a pretty steep discount to Rowley residents. So we lost a significant number of students to that school. So Rowley's decrease, I would say, is falsely deflated. Um, and so where you have, uh, or what the result is, is that um, while it's a 3.8% average increase, Newbury's increase is 4.26%. Rowley's is only 1.13% and Salisbury's is 5.81%. So um, Newbury's increase this year is $420,855. Okay, any uh, questions or comments from the board? Uh, Mike. Ryan, uh, at the finance committee, I was, wa I was watching early before this meeting, they, they said that they're pretty sure all those people from the Clark School are gonna come back to Raleigh. Why is like, are they still going to give the, the steep discount to the residents or is that a one shot deal? Uh, it is not a one shot deal. Um, again, we don't expect all the students will return. We respect okay. the vast majority. Um, again, I, there are folks who have made choices and um, to move to a private school setting and are willing to continue absorbing that tuition. Um, I think there are some who thought they would go and may not return. I think there are those who thought they would go and may not return and can not wait ret to return. Um, we have homeschoolers who I know um, can't wait to have their students return. Um, so yeah, so it's, we don't know for a fact, this is based right. on assumptions, but that that hometown discount at the um, Clark and Rowley is not- How many, how many students went out of Rowley? Uh, Clark, yeah, I mean- uh, To Clark specifically, I don't have that number. Okay. But I believe it was 81 total out of Rowley. Wow. Yeah. 167 total. So about half the half the law was out of law. Okay. Rowley. Yeah. Which means, and I know we've you've heard this at the other meetings too, which means if those students do all return, then Newbury and Salisbury are picking, and I'll use the term picking up the slack this year because of the, the kind of false deflation of Rowley's numbers, which means next year Rowley's numbers would correct. And you in Salisbury and Newbury would have a commensurate um, decrease in your proportion for next year, and Rowley's would be disproportionately higher. Can you just quickly just run out the, the three percentage increase? Salisbury was 5.8. What was Newbury's again? So Newbury's is 4.26. 4.2. And what was Rowley's? 1.3. 1.3. Okay, thank you. 1.13. 1.13, thanks. So Newbury's was about 420,000, Rowley's about 124,000, and Salisbury's is 787,000. Wow. Exactly, yeah. And, and ultimately, you know, in, in working with the town of Salisbury and Neil, they're now over 40% of our district. So um, they're a larger town and a larger student enrollment, and so they understand. Uh, yep. Certainly is a large increase to their assessment. Any other questions, comments from the board? Jerry? Yes, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Forget, uh back in December, uh, Ms. Blaze told us that some of the PEG money was going to be used uh, to uh, start an intern program. How is that coming, that program? I don't have an answer to that. I know we talked about that. So it's uh, not Tracy. coming? So it's not Tracy coming? Got her hand up. Tracy? We, we are working with the district, but we don't plan to start that program probably till next fall due to COVID. Okay. Okay. And how much, how much will, do you anticipate will be needed or will be funding because 95,000 was what the town meeting um, voted to give to uh, your to Triton? So the question is how much would we need for the internship program? Yeah. I don't have an answer for that. So that's those are the details we've been talking about. The the original request was allocated for very specific equipment for the studio, and since then we've you know had the discussion that that is not an allowable cost. Um, so I I don't know the exact answer what the internship would cost, but if it's it's paying for student and interns, it's significantly less than setting up a studio. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, 
from the board, uh, Alicia. Brian, this um, budget that you're discussing here tonight, is, that's the high water mark, correct? Uh, no, this is it now. So the tentative budget on February 10th, um, I want to say, Kyle would be able to tell you, but Newbury's assessment was well into the 500s. Salisbury's was just shy of a million. That was the high water mark with February 10th tentative budget. This is now the final budget. Um, okay. And I should say to you, this is the final budget as it is going to be presented tomorrow night to the school committee. So this is not voted as the final budget, but this is um, the result of what we discussed last week. Um, and ultimately the committee asked us to produce for tomorrow night. So when you get some assumptions that some assumptions that you've made, and maybe this is a question for Kyle, when you when your assumptions that you've made come in, um, do you expect those to come in at a later date? Or is uh, everything in now? No, so there are still some that we're waiting on. A, a good example of that would be regional transportation revenue. So in our initial budget that we had put together for the tentative that you referenced at February 10th. Uh, we had estimated a 74% reimbursement rate for regional transportation from the state. As more information has been coming along, now we have a, uh, we adjusted that to a 78% assumption, but still we won't know until halfway through next year what that actual reimbursement rate is. Uh, okay. Certainly there's been other items that have been more substantiated, but there are a few as well that we're, we're waiting on. Okay, so thank you. Kyle, this budget is down 400, right? It was 300,000 and change plus the 400, the 100 for the health and wellness we pulled out. So this Correct. budget is down between revenues and expenditures over 400,000 from the high water mark on February 10th. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Any other questions from the board? Okay, uh, thanks for joining us tonight, Brian. Uh, and and thank the two Pauls and Maureen. Right, Paul Goldberg, Maureen. Yeah, thanks or... everyone. <laughs> Good night. Thanks for all the work you do on behalf of us students. Right. Thanks, Kyle, too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. Okay, before we get to uh, the review of the draft warrant, um, I'd like to take uh, Chief Lucy for his emergency management director update, just in case the scanner goes off. We don't have him trapped here, unless we, maybe a scanner did go off. I'm not, there he is. There you oh, go. There he <laughs> Can't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> the launch okay. report, a lot going on. Um, some of this stuff that I'm going to be talking about is actually confirmed uh, maybe a half hour prior to the meeting. So there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of uh, confirmations that have happened. So the stuff I'm going to present is I feel pretty good about and, uh, and things are moving along very, very nicely. So uh, the first thing I'm going to say is that as of March 2nd, the DPH report that Newbury is maintaining a status of new positive counts since uh, a status of green. This is based on a 16 new positive cases utilizing the 14 day look back. So with those, uh, with those numbers, it keeps us in the green, which is good. Um, according to that reference DPH report, there have been 1,048 tests administered since my last report to the board. And of those tests, 16 of them are new. And this is a 1.53 percent increase of my last report, but it's still a very, very low, very uh, good number to see. Um, and uh, the big news is the, the Lower Merrimack Valley Regional, Collab Regional Collaborative has successfully facilitated a regional vaccination clinic. Uh, they've been working on this a long time. They've had it in place for a long time. What they didn't have was the vaccines. Uh, that, that has been allotted to them now, and they are receiving 2100 for the first clinic, which is going to be Saturday and Sunday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, that clinic is going to be held at the Amesbury High School at 5 Highland Ave in Amesbury. Um, what's very, very important with this is it, it's only by appointment. And I'm going to get into that and how that works uh, in, in a minute, but I, I just really want to make that clear to everybody. It's very, very important to monitor the town's website for the most up-to-date um, link to make your appointment because they won't take anything off the street. And this clinic, it's mandated that it's open to all Massachusetts residents. So it's not exclusively to the um, 
to to the region uh, participating uh, communities, it has to be to all Massachusetts residents. Um, what we what we do have is the ability to generate the appointment list that's being generated through our collaborative. And once that gets posted, the state picks up on it almost immediately and it gets posted on the state website. So that's why it's imperative to monitor the town's website because we're gonna put it there quickly as soon as we get it. And if our residents uh, you know, that are seeking the vaccine, just be ready to go right in because they fill up fast. Um, and the other thing too, on that's on the spirit of the filling up fast, it's expected that because this is the first clinic for the region, the first couple are going to fill up fast. It's going to be busy. And I don't want anybody to be nervous because this clinic is going to keep on going until it's no longer needed. And they're also going to up the, uh, the frequencies of the, um, the clinics. Uh, they, um, they, uh, plan right now tentatively to have it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I believe that's still in the works, but they're going to increase the frequency of the clinics to accommodate the need and to facilitate whatever it is that's allocated to our clinic. Um, the, um, the next posting of that link, and this is important too, is going to be tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. So everyone wants to monitor our website, eight o'clock in the morning, the link is going to pop up and it's very, very prominent on the town's website. Um, and that's www.newbury, I'm sorry, townofnewbury.org. You know, I, it, it's all posted uh, with the, um, the code red that I just sent out. Uh, it's posted on our website, the links. Uh, and so you just really want to monitor that because those links are generated on a case, on a, on a clinic by clinic basis. So, uh, and they will change. And then uh, there'll be another posting of a link tomorrow at noontime. So if you log in and you, and you miss the opportunity to get an appointment at eight, check it again at noontime. Um, what's the benefit for our community and the communities that are involved here is that uh, it is more likely that we, with these um, reports and with uh, the community staying in touch with the, uh, the quickest uh, access to the information, they'll be ready to jump on the appointments before the state picks up, before the state posts. And it's very unlikely that people are gonna be staring at the state's website and, and, and refreshing to get here. So we'll have, hopefully, the, uh, our, our folks uh, will, be, will be able to get in there quick. So we just wanna get it out there. And it's a fine balancing act too, in the sense that you don't want to hit this in social media because you don't want to go viral either, you know? So we're, we're just very, we're streamlining it. This is where you want to be. This is where we want our community logging in on the town's website, monitoring that link, getting on it, getting your appointment and, and, um, and, and getting it done. Um, but again, I just want to really stress that don't panic. Nobody panic, you know, it, this isn't going, this isn't a one shot deal no pun intended, this is a, a continuing clinic until uh, our needs are met. That's how it's presented um, to me. Another, in, another important uh, uh, bit of information to convey is of this first uh, allotment to our clinics, 60 are earmarked for our uh, elderly you know, uh, citizens over 75 that haven't been vaccinated yet, whether they're homebound or they, you know, they're having issues or they can't get in there, but they are of the, of the, in the risk category. And the Council on Aging with uh, Cindy Currier and her team have been aggressively out there with an outreach program to get a list going for that airmarked group. And, uh, and they've been very, very successful with that. I was just talking to her uh, prior to this meeting and, and things are going very, very well with their efforts. So a lot's been going on. A lot, a lot of good things are happening, uh, you know, to keep our folks safe. And you know, and, and the high risk seniors, the high risk populace that we have, are really going to have an opportunity just, you know, to get this done. And but they really have to monitor. Uh, family has to monitor for their loved ones or whatever, just to make sure that you know this first group, you know, can get in there with with that link. Uh, right now. It's still a 70 plus group for this particular clinic that may change. This is one of those variables that I'm just, I'm not 100% sure on. There are still, like I said, and I apologize for this, but there, there's a few moving parts. And as soon as I find out if that's broadened for this particular clinic and that's confirmed, 
I'll let people know. I'd much rather be very definitive on this is the group that can do it and expand it as I get solid information rather than say, this is the group can do it. I'm sorry, you can't. So that's where I'm at right now. I expect there'll be updates. This is, this is, there's a lot going on, but it's good stuff. Um, let me see if I'm missing anything here. So um, as far as where they're going to be held, the, um, there are three locations. So again, there's nine communities involved. So they, they pick areas that will be convenient on what, you know, as, they, as they rotate around to each community. Um, right now, as I said, this weekend, it's Amesbury High School. Um, the, the schedule hasn't been set, but in the future, it's going to be a Pearly School in Georgetown. And then it'll be in the West Newbury Annex building. Uh, the addresses for these facilities we posted, all, all, when all this gets solidified, it'll be there. So it's, our, our goal is, and I've been in communication with our new IT person, um, Matt, who's been, who's been really good and really helpful. He's going to be keeping the website up to date. Eight o'clock tomorrow morning, he's going to be right there changing that link so uh, people can be ready and, and, and can get their appointments. So that would be my report. Pretty exciting stuff. Um, that would be my report, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Chief Lucy. You're welcome. Mr. Okay. Chairman, can I ask a question? Really yes. Quick. Um, John, I was... Um, I looked on the website and it says you can um, add to a waiting list and somebody will contact you about your appointment. Who is managing that? Who is going to be doing Amesbury, that? Amesbury Fire Department is managing the list and managing the, the updated links. They're generating the links and updating it. Um, I am going to find out what exactly the waiting list means for you because I had that same question when I logged when I checked it to make sure it was there. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to find out uh, and I'll let you know what that means. Okay, thank you. It might be as simple as you're on a waiting list and the next one comes up, you'll be notified. But I'll find out, I'll get more specifics for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks, John. You're welcome. All right, we'll move on to the warrant review. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I put together a preliminary draft um, that we could uh, review tonight in the hopes of um, having a, an updated draft for our joint meeting with the Finance Committee on the 23rd. Most of what you see on the warrant this time is um, pretty standard with the exception of some, uh, a few bylaw amendments and changes. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, this, in terms of the line item budget, we'll be discussing that and going through that in its entirety next week, uh, next meeting with the FinCom. The, uh, we have received one citizen's petition uh, submitted by uh, Marshall Jesperson. It will be appearing on the warrant as the signatures have been certified by the town clerk. Uh, in the past, um, Finance Committee has not chosen to weigh in on anything unless it does have um, some kind of financial interest. So in the meeting of the 23rd, we'll also be taking the votes of the Select Board and the Finance Committee to enter into the uh, appropriations booklet. So on Article 6, we are looking to, again, add to our stabilization fund. This is a standard um, appropriation that we make annually. Stabilization fund is used to fund our um, asset replacement program. And uh, this article would require a two thirds vote in order for it to be approved at the, um, at the, um, I'm sorry, the current balance in the stabilization fund is $605,804. And we're looking to spend a little over 168,000 at the town meeting for our capital replacements. At the end of town meeting, should all of the articles proposed be approved, 
we would cl uh, close out the meeting with about 500, a little over 500,000 in the stabilization fund. So we still have, we'd still be able to maintain adequate reserves. Article seven is seeking 100,000 to put into our OPEB account. Again, this is, this is something we've been doing for quite a number of years now, I think nine or 10 years. Um, last few years, we've committed 100,000 a year. Right now, the OPEB trust has a little over 538,000. We, um, we updated our actuarial analysis and our, our liability has actually gone down. So right now we're looking at a liability of a little over 5.9 million. Um, normally I might ask that you consider adding money from free cash to kind of offset that in a higher amount. But given the fact that we're still looking at addressing capital needs, the town hall and the council on aging most specifically, I think once those are completed, that's when you'd probably want to look at committing larger amounts to the uh, to the liability. Article eight um, is seeking twenty five thousand for our stormwater management uh, purposes. Right now, we've got a little over ninety eight thousand in that account. The MS four permit. Um, is in, in place and the stormwater management team meets periodically. Um, John O'Connell is the person sharing that. Those funds are used for um, consultants. They're used for testing kits and things like that. Let's see, Article 9 is the annual PEG access appropriation. Uh, the operation, the operational expenses total $95,000 that uh, the balance in that account right now, um, the, the PEG access revolving account is $656,627.25. Article 10 is the revolving funds, the recreation revolving funds and the municipal uh, waterways, also known as the Harbor Master Fund. Those, are, those amounts are not increasing from previous year's budgets. The ambulance enterprise, um, again, we've been able to quite successfully uh, make this a self-sustaining enterprise and we are um, charging the town's indirect costs against the enterprise fund. Article 12, we had two unpaid bills. What happens is at the close of the fiscal year, um, if a bill should come in beyond July 15th that uh, requires our attention, um, it has to be put on a town meeting warrant. We don't have the authority to pay a previous year's, uh, previous fiscal year's bill um, in the current fiscal year. So that's why you're seeing them appear on the warrant. And that vote does, that does require a nine tenths vote. Article 13, um, that number reflects a bond premium that we received. Um, we have in the past, I want to say the past two or three town meetings, we have um, taken appropriation balances as well as uh, bond premiums and we have swept them into the uh, town hall project account. So I was making an assumption here that you would wanna continue doing that. So there's, that's the balance in that account. The next article um, is the overlay surplus account. There's a little over 500,000 in that account. Um, I'm proposing that you put that into the town hall project account. One thing that I left off, um, I thought you may want to deliberate on it. Last year, we moved a million dollars from free cash into the town, town hall project account. This year, we've certified our free cash at a little over 3.2 million. I mean, I, I would certainly make a recommendation that you consider moving an amount. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to add that on if you're interested in moving an amount from 
free cash into that account. If you know you moved up to a million and a half, we'd still have an, uh, enough of an available balance that if you move forward with a, a town hall COA and we have to borrow a portion of it, our reserves will be adequately funded to the point that it wouldn't impact our, our bond rating. Um, and we could conceivably have a little over $3 million in that savings account for the project by the end of this town meeting, which would certainly offset a portion of the project costs. Any thoughts from the board on that idea? I like it. Yeah, it certainly makes sense to me. Okay. Just, I, I just give it some more thought, that's all. Okay, I, I would be comfortable with moving a million into that account. A million? So, Mr. Chairman, I, I move that we add an article to, um, to transfer 1.5 million um, out of free cash to the town hall project account. Second. All right, discussion? Yeah. Gary? Um, so this, this free cash, this is the cash that is left over after we've uh, paid all our bills and our operating costs. So we've got excess money, correct? It's a little more complicated than that. It is the end of operation. So it's the results of operations. So we budget revenues as well as expenditures. So any um, line item appropriations that say the uh, DPW expense account, the snow and ice account, we had a relatively mild winter. So if we don't fully spend that amount, the balance would close out to free cash. Right. Also on the revenue side, um, if, you, <laughs> if you budget um, budget for interest earnings at $100,000 and we have a great year and we end up earning $150,000, that also becomes a component of free cash. Um, right. And there's also, we have to consider receivable balances and right. things that But the cross. bottom line is then the monies that you haven't dedicated to any particular bill or expense, right? They are not, you can't, town meeting is the only body that can appropriate it for right. an expense, correct? And so I guess if I were a frugal taxpayer, I'd say, well, instead of, you know, transferring a hundred and a half million uh, to um, an account, why not lower the tax bill for the taxpayers and give it back to the taxpayers? It's entirely up to you. Well, I don't agree with that because, I mean, I think if our capital needs were met um, and our OPEB liabilities were met mm -hmm. and uh, the town was um, in... Um, I want to call it perfect fiscal order because we've we're much better than we were 10 years ago, but we still have a long way to go. Um, I we still have a council on aging needs and we still have um, a town hall. So it's six of one half a dozen of the other. If you give it back to the taxpayer and you still need to solve the town hall and council on aging, for instance, then you uh, issues, then you have to go for an override. So you have to either give it back and ask, or this is no uh, tax impact to the ta to the taxpayer. It is absolutely nothing. Um, the town still has um, capital needs and it still has OPEB liabilities that will affect our bond rating if we don't if we don't take good care of our fiscal house. So I I don't. If all of those were met and we were in good fiscal needs and we still have all this money in free cash, I'm right with you, Jerry. It belongs back to the taxpayer. But I think if we do it now, we're going to um, hurt ourselves in the long run where we have such a tremendous need still. And I, um, I hope um, most people can take comfort in knowing that um, having this amount in free cash is a result of good financial practices and also projects coming in under budget and on time instead of running over. And uh, we're, we're very, very fortunate um, to be in the financial situation we are today as opposed to five years ago and 10 years ago to be able to do this. And um, no, I 
I, I can see where you're coming from, Jerry. No, I mean, I, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate because I am, I am, people I are out It's like, whoa, they've got all this money. What, you know, why? Right. Why aren't we getting a refund in our taxes? So. Just, right. No, I know, and I guess my rationale is, um, is, um, you know, we could, we could give a tax break for a year or two, but it would be a, yeah. I'd feel good, and then, you know, when. We'd have to go back and ask. Hall, reality sets and we would have to be going for the full amount for an override. Okay, I just wanted to explore the issue. Understood. No, thank you. Um, and the other thing too is the town of Newbury has, our tax rate is set at $10.99 per thousand. Um, if you look at our surrounding communities just over at uh, West Newbury and uh, Groveland, just the uh, Newburyport, just the ones that surround us, Mm -hmm. Rowley, um, they're almost, uh, they're at like four, between anywhere between 13, a little under 12, you know, 12.90 or whatever, up to over $15 and change per thousand. So if you were to pick your house up, like my house, uh, my taxes are around $7,800 a year. If I was to pick my home up and put it in one of my surrounding towns, my taxes would be anywhere between fifteen and $18,000 a year. So- mm -hmm. We Newbury is is very lucky that we have such a low. We have one of the lowest tax rates in the state. We do, we do definitely. Yeah. Compared to Newburyport, it's mm -hmm. amazing. I would like to just weigh in very quickly too. Um, the needs that we have for our facilities is still pretty serious. Um, I mean, even our highway bond that functions now probably needs work. Certainly the Council on Aging, certainly the Town Hall. So we're just making steps forward to um, be able to do some things that probably really should have been a, done a long time ago in this town. So a lot of other towns address these things before us and they're just coming to us now. And the cost of doing business, the cost of building now is getting to be like building materials now have doubled. So we're certainly going to pay the freight for waiting. At least yeah. all the money right now is not expensive, but certainly the materials to build it is. And, you know, to, to Jeff's point, um, it's only recently that we've had a capital planning um, plan to replenish our capital planning thing. So for years and years and years, Newbury just didn't replenish anything and i'm going back to the 40s and the 50s and the 60s you know we just didn't we just broke it state it stayed there um the towns run differently now and i think it's it's a benefit to every um taxpayer and resident in town that that we we operate as a professional town that's part of the reason alicia that you have free cash is that the town is you know well planned and well run right <clears throat> So is there a motion on the table, Julie? There is. Oh, you're, um, you're muted, Julie. Sorry about that. Yes, the motion was the 1.5 million um, moved from the free cash over into the town hall project. And you had put the motion out there and Jeff had second. Okay, I'll move to a roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? No. Jerry Heavey? No. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby, yes. Okay. Um. So could I and just ask a question? I just have one question, Tracy. I'm sorry. Um, okay. select, select Woman Heaving and Select Woman Doyle voted no. I was just wondering to know what the, um, the logic behind that was. My reason, I, I said the logic why I thought it was good. I just like to know what it is right now. I don't know enough about this. It, it's like I want to look into it more. I want to talk to some people more. I want to feel what the people of the town think too. So, so I right now I can't. Maybe when it gets to town meeting, I'll be in behind it. Okay. But, but right, thank it's you. just it's just too too new right now. Okay, thank you. And, and Michael, that's part of the reason that it's on the warrant for town meeting. Right. Right. That's what we did tonight. So. And Jerry, why? What was your yeah, logic behind? I it? I echo um, Mr. Doyle and. Um, also, it's, you know, the town hall, town hall project. I mean, it's, 
what is the project? We, we, we don't have any idea of any specificity, but we're, we're salting away this money. You know, it's too, too vague, too nebulous. Okay, point, point well taken. So as soon as we get the Council on Aging um, <clears throat> Space Needs Assessment back, I think we should have um, Chairman Colby, I'm going to ask you to put on the agenda to move to a design phase of this project so that people will understand what it is we're squirreling away for. Thank you. Thank you. Article 15 adds another $100,000 toward the uh, Newbury roof repair project. We've already completed about 16,000 square feet of this project with the last appropriation. Um, overall, this will, tr this will take us about from beginning to end about six years to complete it. But again, this is what we're doing with this is the same thing we're proposing doing with the town hall is trying to save money over a period of time rather than going out for a b override bond issue um, that would have much more significant impact to those the tax uh, burden that you spoke about earlier so most of the decisions that are being made here are being made with um, understanding that people enjoy the the lower tax burden here in Newbury and want to keep it that way. So, Article sixteen is um, Ms. Tracy. Yes. What is what is the what so far? How much have we spent on the school repair then? Um, I'd have to look on last year's warrant. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I can send it to you Thank first you. thing tomorrow. In, initially, the uh, the rubber roof repair at the school. It was going to be nearing about a million dollars, if I remember correctly, if we did it all over. Up. Yeah. And, and we've we had it looked at and assessed and it, we were able to phase in sections of it. So it's not as crippling of a project. But it, as we roll through the next couple of years, we'll replace the sections till it's all redone. Nothing is truly failing right now. The big, you know, leaks have been temporarily taken care of, but they're going to work on the most problematic parts of the roof. And I'm just looking at last year's warrant. It was 92,700 we appropriated last year. Okay. Um, DPW is also re uh, wishing to replace their John Deere Z-Track uh, mower. It's got uh, 1,485 mile, uh, hours on it, miles. Um, that mower is used four or five times a week at the, uh, all, well, all around town, but sig most significantly, obviously, at Manterfield. Um, this, I, I want to say they use it for about 26 weeks out of the, out of the year. Um, both of those I should have mentioned, actually, all three of these articles, 15, 16, and 17, have been before the Capital Planning Committee and were approved. In addition, all three of those articles will require a two thirds vote. And the, the final capital replacement is seeking $54,625 um, to purchase a new dump truck. The one that's being replaced has over 118,000 miles on it. Um, normally we have about an eight year lifespan on those. This one is 10 years old. We do, if it, you know, if the vehicle remains in good shape and we can extend it, we do um, until the point where the repairs start to get too costly. Um, and then we move it forward in the asset replacement program. Um, Article 95 is uh, per, coming to us from the Conservation Commission changes to the wetlands bylaw and uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Brian Colloran is here for the Conservation Commission. Yes. Um, okay. To give you a little update. Okay. How are you, How are you Brian? Hi. Right. How are you guys doing? You're having a great meeting just like we are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everything is easy. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, Have some Zoom. <laughs> So yeah, just to say, uh, sort of what we're getting at with uh, the bylaw thing, um, we're seeing a lot uh, more projects. There seems to be an uptick in projects 
and we seem to be having the, the same conversations a lot about what needs to be changed about a project, what we want to see the plan show. Um, and so one of the big drivers really is to get the ability to have an established regulations so that, you know, our agent, uh, Bill Holt, when he sees something come in, you know, he can look at the plans and say, oh, you know, you need to show the plans in a certain way, or you need to take this off, or you need to put this thing on and just shorten the review process. You know, we don't have to have people come to a meeting to hear an answer that we already have. We, you know, we don't need to discuss it. Um, and so that would really help everybody, we think, both on our end and on the other end, whether it's the applicant or their consultant. Uh, so that's a big driver. Um, we also kind of want to uh, consolidate the administration a little bit and make it cleaner, you know, because right now, you know, we've got the bylaw that applies to Plum Island, but nowhere else, you know, and so we'd like to sort of even it out uh, and taking it away from Plum Island isn't really in the cards, you know, because that's just weird and unusual. And I don't know of any other towns in the Commonwealth that have half a bylaw uh, running through their con um, The uh, The other thing is that, you know, we're working on a state law that we don't really have any influence over. And so if we set up the bylaw, we can actually address some of these stranger situations that come up when, like at the moment we're working through a project that the state law that we're administering basically doesn't give us any answers. We have no, um, you know, we're guessing in a, in, a, in a very legalistic way, we're basically guessing how to handle a certain project. And because we can not engage with the state law, if we were to put the bylaw back on the table and have this in place, then we could learn our lesson from the first mistake, you know, engaging with the state law and then say, you know what, going forward, we know how to handle the situation. Let's just put it in the bylaw or put it in the regs or, you know, wherever the appropriate place is. And so then we don't have to learn the same lesson twice, especially considering that, you know, people turn over and, you know, in five years and 10 years, if uh, the same thing happens, they don't need to, you know, figure it out. It's written down. Um, the other thing that's nice about this um, is that right now, if um, any decision is appealed, it goes to the DEP. Uh, and if we put the bylaw in place, our decisions, if they get appealed, it actually ends up going uh, to the Superior Court. And so what's, actually, what's nice about that, in a manner of speaking, is that nobody wants to go to court. Uh, and so it encourages both the Commission as well as the applicants to, you know, negotiate further and to, to work longer than maybe might have happened if, they, you know, the applicant said, you know what, DEP is going to do this, we'll go to DEP. Um, it just sort of it, it increases that sort of local influence and local input that right now we don't have because we can't engage with DEP. Once it goes to DEP, we're out. You know, it's their project. Um, we don't even monitor it, right? It's their project. Um, the, what else? I've got my list here that I'm going through. Um, yeah. And so the other two pieces of this, um, that we've got in mind are that, you know, most of the neighborhood has a wetlands bylaw. And so that means that then we're sort of low hanging fruit for bad developments in a manner of speaking. If somebody wants to come in and try to sneak something through, where are the people to do it to in a manner of speaking? Um, so that, you know, makes us nervous once in a while, because we have seen a couple of projects come through that needed a little bit more handholding. And if we had some legs on the books that, you know, the plan has to be X, you know, the status of, um, your engineering has to be Y, you know, you, you've got to have your, um, you know, your specs up to point Z, you know, whatever we're talking about. It just makes it easier for us to, to see a bad project coming early and adjust it you know, ahead of time. Uh, and then if this is of interest, the other thing too, is that it gives us more uh, influence and control over permitting fees. And so if a big project came through, you know, instead of the hundred dollars that DEP charges, you know, we could play with the uh, fee structure a little bit and that would arguably um, offset some of the costs that, uh, you know, having Bill Holt in the conservation office, you know, that those employees in the town you know, 
that's not something that is uh, on the table. We're not looking at that. You know, that's not really what we're talking about, but it is something to bring up and, you know, let you know about. So, you know, that's the, the short version. Okay. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Ryan, we, we deflect through to the state wetlands bylaw now, mostly. How does that work? Yeah. Um, that's a big question. Can you, can you narrow it down for me a little? Well, you know, my concern always is because we're so coastal, you know, and I have great respect for our coastal regions, but sometimes they seem to ob arbitrarily be demarcated by FEMA maps and, you know, <clears throat> all the other components that go along with it. So, you know, I, I haven't really looked enough at this. I want to make sure that we're not making, certainly we need not to have development come into our town that isn't good development. But we also don't want to make it so that some of our residents that are here can't maybe fix or do some of the things that they need to do to be able to maintain their homes. So, oh yeah, no, we're not going down that at all. I haven't, like I said, yeah. I haven't really dissected this and you guys have always been fair, but that would be obviously the criticism, you know, that would be coming if, if it really got to that stage. So that's kind of my, yeah, yeah. my third, my third, <clears throat> my third realness, you know, to you, to you guys. Yeah, totally. I know exactly what you mean. You know, the nothing changes the property rights issue, right? Like we're not going down any of those paths. You know, the, the way that I always talk about um, being on the concom is that we're helping you to protect the thing that you want to protect anyway. You know, when people talk about, you know, living on Plum Island and loving the island and they would never do anything to hurt the island, right? They don't know that, you know, having um, a structure that's a foot off the ground is bad, but having a structure two and a half feet off the ground is good, right? Because of the dune grass and the way the sand moves. And, you know, we're just filling in people's knowledge so that they can make a decision that they want to make anyway. Um, so we're not crossing into any of that stuff where we're making things harder for people necessarily especially from the, um, the redevelopment end of things, right? Um, arguably, if something's gonna be made harder, it would be a new development that's coming <laughs> in that is trying to, you know, oh, how should you frame it? They're, they're trying to skip things in a manner of speaking. Like for instance, right now, um, the way the bylaw that we've got on the table is written up, we're covering now vernal pools, right? And a vernal pool is essentially like a frog and salamander nursery. You know, if you like the sound of peepers in the spring, then you like vernal pools. And vernal pools aren't protected at all by the state law and only acquire coverage for protection through a local bylaw. And so, you know, things like that were sort of in, you know, the current standing in the current moment, if somebody came in and wanted to like pave over a vernal pool, they could. Like it's there's nothing saying they couldn't from the conservation commission and the what and the state wetlands law perspective. Um, so like that would make development harder, absolutely. You know if they wanted to get in and do that kind of thing, um, or or uh, an isolated wetland, uh, it's the same situation. Um, we did add some coverage for isolated wetlands that aren't connected to a river or um, a water body or you know they're kind of out in the woods on their own. Uh, and again, they're not exactly vernal pools. It's not the same thing, but they provide resources um, that would be lost. And there wouldn't be anything we could say about that. Um, so from that perspective, maybe makes things harder, but arguably uh, the trade-off is worthwhile, you know, because I like peepers, but that might just be me. <laughs> no, you're not, you're not alone. <laughs> hey, Jerry, I know you've been waiting. Um, uh, I don't know if you can answer this, but um, is this um, bylaw similar to the bylaw that they're proposing uh, in Newburyport for um, the Plum Island portion? 
Do you know how the, the, the two would interface? Yeah, so we're not touching what's out on the island. This is uh, only going to be an inland addition because um, the way that the, the bylaw for the island is set up, you know, that was a, um, a legal requirement. And so we just, this is more of an amendment to a standing bylaw rather than something, you know, new. Uh, and so we did not touch Plum Island. We're not going to engage with that because, you know, in a manner of speaking, first things first. Uh, and then in terms of um, how the one bylaw in one town interacts with another bylaw in another town, uh, in a manner of speaking, they don't, you know, because their bylaw would be administered through their concom and this bylaw would be administered through our concom. Arguably, if there's a parcel that's in both towns, you know, then they're going to interact. But um, that would just be one of those strange situations that you see once every couple of years. Uh, and it would be so site specific that I don't know that the generality uh, would apply. Okay. Did I hear you correctly? You're saying that this doesn't apply to Plum Island? No, no, the, the, the bylaw for Plum Island exists already. Oh, okay. But, and but, we are not engaging with it. We're leaving it on paper as is, and we're not touching any of that. Even though know, you, you're giving specific performance standards for the barrier beach, isn't that Plum Island? Oh, those exist already. That's already on the book. Well, it's here, it's here in front of us as part of these bylaws. Right. What, what I, um, that bylaw already is a Newberry bylaw. The language you're looking about the performance standards is the standing current in Newberry bylaw for the Conservation Commission. And so we're adding on to the barrier beach language. So the, the section that you're looking at, yeah. is, we already have. And that's something that we're just adding on to for the inland wetlands. Okay, it's a strange way to strange drafting. Very strange. Okay. So I think, excuse me, what might be helpful is if um, we could get maybe a yellow line copy before town meeting of, of what exists and what's been changed from the conservation. Yeah. Commission. Um, that, that's easy enough, but it's also, in a manner of speaking, there's, there's a, oh, I don't have it sitting on my computer. You know, whatever the current bylaw is, right, the, the, the performance standards are a really good example because those really shouldn't be in a bylaw. That's a really bad place to put performance standards. And ideally, maybe in the next generation, if we re-engage with this later, we would actually take those performance standards out of the bylaw and make them a regulation. Uh, but, you know, that's what we already have and what we have to work with. Um, so, you know, like, you know, I'll talk to Bill and, you know, we can do that uh, to a version where you can see sort of where the current bylaw and where the, the proposed changes, you know, where the, the two different, but um, anything that says Plum Island uh, in what you've got is something that we already have. In the Plum Island Overlay District, right? Yeah. So the PIO, yeah, I mean, Ryan, do you have a public hearing for these? Uh, that's the next thing on the to-do list. Good. Yep. And then town council probably too, you know, just run it through there. Yep. Right. Um, town council had a look at it. Um, okay. One of the things that we need to talk to her about is she suggested changes to the Plum Island uh, aspect of the law. And we need to double and maybe triple check with her because um, we really don't want to touch that. You know, it feels like one of those, you know, live wires. Uh, and so if, if she thinks that the language change is just, um, you know, just to clear up grammar, that's one thing. Um, but yeah, we're going to double, triple, and quadruple check about that. Yeah, I was on the planning board when the PIOD went in, and it's pretty specific. So pretty specific yeah and so, um i guess my know. next question is this draft before us may not be what shows up on town meeting floor correct that may be massaged a little bit yeah yeah that's right. 
Okay. Because we haven't had the public comment period. We haven't had the public <laughs> feedback. We haven't, yeah. you know, integrated in, you know, what people are going to say. And there's a couple of um, tweaks that we got about grammar from uh, town council, but, you know, she didn't change anything or make any comments that looked like more than grammar, legal grammar. Great. Thank you. Hey, I have a, uh, a couple questions. Um, this bylaw change, um, first of all, I want to you and your board. I know when you get digging into the bylaws and changing things around, there's lots of back and forth on your board. There's lots of back and forth with council and, you know, public hearing coming up. Um, and thank you for, you know, looking into these things and trying to bring the town up to date and practices. Um, I have two questions. One is how this pertains to agriculture. Um, in laying fields fallow, giving fields a break. Um, what I wouldn't want is farm operations to be afraid to give a field a break. You know what I mean to be afraid to leave it fallow for two years or three years, maybe even up to five years to let the soil biology recover. You know, get get some amendments into it, you know, whether it be my by nature or manure. Um, I wouldn't want to get into a situation where hands are being overworked for fear of it being taken away. I don't know if you could offer any insight into that. Yeah. So, um, in a manner of speaking, we didn't touch the agricultural end of things with this bylaw. You know, the by the, the current state uh, law is still the one that's going to hold. Um, you know, in a manner of speaking, all those points you just raised are why we didn't go into this. You know, we want to sort of um, update the things we know first, and then if there's a uh, an appetite to change things, you know, on the agricultural end, then by all means, let's figure that out. But the mm -hmm. at the moment, off the top of my head, I'm trying I'm rolodexing and thinking about this. Uh, I don't think there's any influence, impact, repercussions for field fouling. You know, it would get into maybe, you know, if you were to cut a new field and the field just happened to have a vertical pool in the middle of it, you know, that's the conversation. Um, but in terms of existing fields and existing uh, practice, I'm not coming up with any no, I think I think there would just be the usual uh, state law and how it works. And, you know, the point being made earlier was that if you do want to have greater influence over how uh, the wetlands law, in, in, you know, how it works in town, then maybe we want to talk about that and add that in later. Because, like, you know, for all the reasons I mentioned before about making it a superior court thing as opposed to going to DP and about having the ability to like address what you just said, say, hey, you know, you want to let the field fallow for five years. Okay, great. You know, we're going to write it in that that's okay. Um, you know, but at the moment, there's nothing that I can think of that uh, would address your points. Okay. The second thing I picked up on, which, which might be kind of a third rail situation, um, on inspections of property, it sounded like uh, commission members or the agent would be allowed to basically have a property without a, you know, I don't know about a proper authorization. And um, I could see where that's been problematic. People are definitely protective. And I know, and I might be wrong, but I think in prior conversations with Doug Packer, when he was our agent, you know, he said, as the agent, if there was an issue, he could enter any property he wanted as long as he had his vest on his proper things displayed. What I, I guess what I would want to avoid is people looking out their back window and, you know, maybe seeing commission members just out of curiosity, cutting through public property, things like that. If, am I, am I reading this correctly or incorrectly? Yeah, that's one of those things that you're right. It's a little third really. Um, from a legal perspective, you need to put that stuff in because if you don't put it in, then like the opposite is worse in a manner of speaking. But um, I don't know anybody 
on any concom, any agent in the Commonwealth, right, that doesn't exhaust all of their good manners first, right? And then if they're right. going to uh, consider like trespassing, right, you know, they write a letter, they, you know, send the letter three different times, you know, they, they call the cops and they say, hey, you know, help me out here. What's the story? You know, then you go knock on the door, right? Like they exhaust all their options before they just go for, you know, random traits through people's yards. Um, but if you don't have that particular language as framed in there, then you can't go at all in the manner of speaking. So this would be a situation if somebody refused to respond, basically, it would be a last resort. Oh, yeah. I mean, let's be honest. You know, it's it's right. It's regulatory issues for wetlands. You know, we're not picking fights. Not like that. Right. I just want to dispel any of these, you know, and I, I know we're all picking things up. And I just, it's good to have this conversation and dispel some of it before town meeting. So, all right, that, those, oh, yeah. are, those are my two questions. And again, thanks for undertaking this and you know, you and your, your board, it's, it's a ton of work. And I mean, I've, I've been looking at some of your meetings and they're, they're even longer than ours a lot of the time. So it's, you're doing good work over there and it's not unappreciated. Oh, uh, yeah. This, this one that I need to go back to is, <laughs> Anyway, whatever. Um, so yeah, what else you got? Come on, give me a hard one. Anybody? No, you might have exhausted us for tonight. Ah, uh, well, fine. <laughs> Ryan, I think we, I think we all have to look at it a little more too. So. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah, reach out I mean, if we have any questions. No. Yeah, just the one piece of advice is don't read it after it gets dark out. Yeah. You're going <laughs> to. All right. Have thanks. All right. Thanks. Thank Have you, a good night. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Keep us rolling, Tracy. Okay. Um, the next article is cha proposed changes to the selectman administrative form of government mm -hmm. for the town of Newbury. That is the um, chapter 460 of the acts of 2008. Um, uh, one of the changes that's being proposed is changing the title board of selectmen or selectmen to the select board as we've done with um, all of our bylaws. The second and third changes, changes to chapter, um, I'm sorry, chapter 13 change. Uh, Martha's title has been changed to planning director. Um, so we, I would propose changing town planner to planning director. And then section 15 and section 16 are relative to how the annual operating budget um, cycle works. And to my knowledge, neither of these have ever been adhered to since this act was put in place. I know it hasn't um, in at least the last 12 years, um, but I don't think it ever was. Because of the way our regional school district works and their budget cycle, there really is no way to have this document completed on the timelines that were set forth in the act. I think um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, town council at the time, Tony Penske wrote it. Um, obviously it was written prior to having a town administrator in this form of government in place. So it probably is, um, is time to make some amendments based on what actually transpires. So that's what 15 is. And 16 talks about um, the finance, the selectmen turning over a budget document to the finance committee. We've never done that either what we do is the finance committee and the board of selectmen work um, parallel so you work in conjunction with one another so they have the documents pretty much <laughs> at the same time that you guys have the documents um, and then we meet jointly um, they don't um, they don't have things they're not given things at a certain date they're given everything right from the beginning um, so it that's that's the changes to what we actually do versus what was in the act. And then article 20, um, actually I'll let Martha <laughs> give you the update on that. She's here with us tonight. Hi, good evening. So um, I don't have the warrant in front of me. I assume that's a zoning amendment. It is. Okay. Um, 
So basically what, uh, what I did was take the language that was voted at the last select board meeting and revise what had originally been proposed and took that back to the planning board. And uh, so that revised language was voted at last week's meeting uh, to go ahead, which uh, kept the, the public hearing and a butter notification portion of the existing article and added the, the criteria and the conditions portion of it that required just a little bit of minor uh, reformatting of the article. And so the, um, the public hearing on that is gonna be held on March 24th at 645. Uh, it's already been noticed in the paper yesterday, or uh, yes, yesterday, and will be again next Monday. So if there are any changes that come out of the public hearing, we'll get those um, you know, up to the town administrator immediately so that they could be incorporated into the or proposed for the warrant that gets voted on the 30th. Okay, any questions from the board, comments? Um, I, I have one comment, but not on the zoning amendment. Okay. Um, so um, I had met with the chair of the cultural council, Robin Lott Lawton, Lawson. Lawson. I'm sorry, Robin. Lawson. Lawson. Yes. Um, and um, she's working with a few um, residents in um, Byfield and in, uh, in on Plum Island to create a Newbury Town Day cel celebration. Um, she's working with uh, Heidi um, that put on the uh, Byfield Days. And she's working with, I believe her name is Cindy, or she's trying to get in touch with Cindy um, that does Plum Fest. And the goal is to have a town day celebration in the spring, sometime I believe in June, they're looking at 2022, um, that will celebrate um, all three distinct um, sections of Newberry. Uh, she wants to have it on the green and they're putting together a steering committee now. Um, what I'd like to do is propose that we add in the financial um, section of the budget that we add a, an article um, allocating $5,000 towards this um, celebration, similar to what we do for the Memorial Day celebration. Um, so that's what second. I would like to happen. Was that a motion? Yes. Okay. I second. move. Yeah. Discussion. Uh, any, any questions with anybody? I mean, I'll, I'll second it so we can go into discussion. <laughs> so, okay. Thank I mean, you, that's putting that aside. So when they form a committee, they have you know something to work with when the committee forms and everything. Yes, else. they should have a committee all formed before town meeting, and they'll have. Um, she's writing. I know the cultural council is writing grants for this as well, um, and I don't know what they're going to do about donations. They'll probably take donations in as well. That's. I don't think they're quite there yet. They're looking together to put a steering committee. They're looking to put a steering together a committee together of no more than eight people. Um, I think this is a wonderful idea. I think everybody has been um, cooped up in their houses too long because of COVID. Um, we're talking about a parade, a parade similar to Byfield Days in the morning, um, along the green, having um, all of our nonprofits, maybe the Friends of the Library, the PTAs, the Council on Aging, have um, the veterans have their little booths describing what is available to town residents. Um, uh, the thought is to get Spencer Pierce Little Farm engaged in historic New England and have the um, Sweat Isley House and all of our historic homes uh, open free of charge to Newbury residents. Um, there should be no cost to, to Newbury residents to do, to do this as well. Um, and uh, they want to culminate at the end of the evening with um, a, a battle of the bands or a concert, so to speak, with um, the young kids, uh, Triton, they want to get Triton involved. Um, and then possibly um, a laser show at the very end of the evening at night um, over the Parker, over the Parker River. So 
uh, none of that is final, but that's their rough draft of what they would like to see accomplished. Um, they do want to make this an annual event. Um, the town that I grew up in, Winchester, had a similar um, town day, and it was very, very well um, attended. It's been going on since the uh, it started in the mid 70s. It was um, for a couple of years and then it went away. It came back in 1982 and it's been going strong ev ever since. Um, there's a town day committee. Um, and I think that, I think this is just what Newbury needs. It needs to have to, to wipe off the face of the pandemic and get everybody out in the fresh air again. So I'm super excited about it. Jerry? When, when are they anticipating doing this? I think she's looking at June, 2022. Okay, okay. So anybody that is interested, let me know and I can sign you up for something. <laughs> um, what, um, just if anyone asks, what would be the accounting for something like that? I'll ask Tracy, have Tracy answer that. That's what I meant. I am asking Tracy. Hi, Tracy. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, well, if you're proposing we put it as a special article, I would assume you would make an appropriation from free cash. And I just have to um, do a little research on the laws to understand what it can and cannot be yep. expended for. Yep. Okay. We have a motion. Is there any other questions or comments? Yes. Jeff yes. Uh, I'm sorry. You broke up. You ca you called on me, Mr. Yes. Chair? Okay. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Tracy, one of the, the areas that you skipped over was Article 1, and that pertains to our voting, um, our municipal voting um, election day. Um, right. just, oh, hang, just hang, so on a, hang on a second, Jerry. We have a, we have a motion. Alicia had a motion on the floor. Okay. All right. Okay, I'll move to a roll call vote on Alicia's motion. Uh, Alicia Greco. Yes. Mike Doyle. Yes. Jerry Heavey. Yes. Jeff Walker. Yes. And J.R. Colby, yes. Okay, go ahead, Jerry. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, just in the spirit of, um, you know, uh, notification and um, um, educating the voters, because there's a lot of changes and confusion, um, uh, Tuesday, May 11th, 2021, is our municipal election. And the polls, uh, it looks like they're going to be open according to this Article 1 from 7 in the morning to 8 in the evening. Um, and that's a return to our usual hours because the last municipal election, they were only open from noon to 6. So that's, that's I'm happy to see that. Um, also, um, the um, there is um, legislation on Beacon Hill uh, that uh, the... Uh, the uh, Senate, it's going into the Senate uh, this coming week, and uh, it's anticipated that the governor will sign it next week. And it's um, to extend the mail-in uh, ballots like we had at the last municipal election to go to June 30th, so that would cover our uh, municipal election. And that's when people requested a ballot um, and, um, you know, they don't have to have a reason, uh, and that's because of COVID, uh, because as we heard from Chief Lucy, we still haven't established our vaccination. So a lot of people are uncomfortable to go to, uh, to vote. So this allows them to request a ballot and vote by mail. Uh, and also, um, uh, the Secretary of State indicates that, um, the uh, uh, t uh, like we had the last time, uh, we had early voting. If somebody wanted to go to uh, town hall to the clerk's office and vote in person prior to election day, they could do it. And I'm advised by the Secretary of State that the Board of Selectmen uh, has to authorize that uh, the town clerk do that. So. I would uh, move to have the board authorize the town clerk to have early voting hours at convenient times prior to the election as the law allows. Uh, so that would allow us to follow the um, uh, uh, tenor of the law to uh, assist people uh, in um, 
voting if they're not able to vote on May 11th, uh, if they're a, f a first responder or a nurse who has to work out of town at a hospital. Uh, this allows them to go to town hall like they did our last election and vote in person prior to election day. So I would move that. I'll second that. Thank you. And again, it's it's to assist people to vote. Hi, what is this? I don't, sorry, this is kind of, I wasn't aware of this. And I, I, okay. It's been, it's been so, all over the nose. It, yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's the, um, the uh, Secretary of State said that the, for the local elections, um, the Board of Selectmen, they have to uh, authorize the town clerks to have early voting hours. So it's, it's, I move to have the board authorize the town clerk to have early voting hours at convenient times prior to the election as the law allows. So, so you, you said something about June or, or, or it going into June. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a difference. That's a difference. Um, mail-in, that's the mail-in. Um, the last municipal election, we had uh, mail-in ballots. Well, the law right now, it ends uh, at the end of this month. The law that they're talking about uh, is to extend it to June 30th. So that would in fact cover the, our municipal election. So our elections would get moved to the end of June? No, no, no. 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 No, it just, it's the law, the law right now to request a mail-in ballot like we did at, at our last election. That COVID emergency law is slated to end at the end of this month. So the legislation that is about to be signed either this week or next week allows, um, allows it to extend to June. So any June 30th, so any municipalities, if they're having an election, they can have mail-in mail -in ballots at early, um, early uh, voting times. So what does that do to absentee ballots? Again, it doesn't change it. You can always, you can always get an absentee ballot, but what this, what the, what the law, this doesn't even affect that because the, because the Secretary of State will will authorize the mail-in ballots. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dealing with the mail-in ballots. I'm just saying we should authorize the town clerk to have early voting hours. So if anyone's not available on, on the election day, let's say they think they're available, but suddenly, you know, they have to, they can't do it. Well, you know, and they, they get, they get noticed like three days before the election that they've got to work all day on the election. Well, they can call the clerk's office and walk in and vote before election day. Okay. Okay. Um, that was a move in a second, right? Yeah. Um, I think this is a good idea, but I'd like to hear from the town clerk. So I move that we table this to our next meeting and then we can hear from our town clerk. Well, I mean, yeah, I think it's 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 something that that we uh, as a as a select board we need to authorize um, before what day June thirtieth? Well, before before the election, which is May. Yeah, right. so we can table this to the next meeting and ask Leslie to come. Yeah, I, I to definitely us. need to take a deeper dive into this because it seems. I mean, I think it's good, but I think I want to hear from her. Yeah, but I mean, it's just what we did the last election. I'll do all due respect. It's not her decision. It's 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 the oh, board who has to, has to authorize and have to request her to do it. So it's I not her decision. I, it's the board's decision. I, I respect the opinion of the clerk, and I also respect her as being all things elections in this town. I would really like to hear her feedback. Right, I I certainly respect the clerk, but I I think that the clerk has to respect the secretary of state's office and has to do what yeah and the secretary of state's office may come down that we we may not have any other alternative but to do it that way anyway well, right? let's let's relax because it hasn't actually passed that it's extended yet has it jerry no that's that's a diff that's the the mail-in i'm yeah that's I'm the sorry, you've confounded three different, different things, things i think we're talking two different Clear things yeah 
I think they're confounding. Well, again, it's it's I'm I'm attempting to you know iron out all the different strategies for people to you know invoke their right to vote. Right. So, well, actually, I actually that, history. It's important enough to put on the agenda for next next uh, next meeting for sure. Okay. And ask Leslie to come speak to it. Yeah. That'd okay. be great. We have we have two motions on the table. One is Jerry's initial motion. The second one is Alicia's motion to table. So we will take Jerry's motion first. I will move to a roll call vote. Alicia Greco? No. Michael Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? No. J.R. Colby? No. Um, uh, the second motion to table it for discussion till the next meeting. Uh, yes. Are we? Mike Doyle. Oh, uh, are we tabling it or just putting it on the agenda like it should be so we can just okay. make a motion? Just uh, Jerry, I table it until the next meeting. So I guess I want it added to the next agenda. I just have Jerry put it on the agenda and we'll discuss it. So we don't need to table it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you shouldn't. Ta you shouldn't table it. You should. It should be put on the put on the agenda. agenda. All right. So I move to rescind my vote. My vote to table it. So you just you'll move to add this discussion. I move, yeah, I'll do that. I'll move that we add the discussion on early voting, absentee voting, um, all that stuff that Jerry's talking about to our next meeting in two weeks. Is there and a I also move that we ask Leslie to come speak to it. Yes, to that's a good idea. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, roll call vote. Alicia Greco. Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby, yes. Thanks for bringing that up, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, does that, I can, you know, does that conclude our warrant business? It does. Um, one more thing about the warrant. So I know I mentioned, um, I mentioned that the town, uh, the Cultural Council wants to um, have this they also would like um, a, a, a few minutes, I told them no more than five, at annual town meeting to kind of explain to the town what it is that they want to do. I um, wish they had explained tonight. I wish they should have been, if they were on this agenda, they should have been here tonight to explain it. They weren't on the agenda. Though. No, they weren't on the agenda. They, well, they should have. They I can want me been. to ask them to come to our, our Why next we have meeting. To come explain it to us before they come to town meeting. Yeah, I'll have them come. I'll ask that Robin to come name. in the two weeks. So, um, Julie, can you add that to the agenda, agenda in two weeks? Yeah, yeah. to Please. put it on the agenda. Yeah, thank you. Hey, okay, moving on to our administrator's report. Um, Carol LaRock, our animal control officer, has reported to me that the Elder Pet Fund is still going strong and she is currently managing over $30,000 in donations. Wow. Um, yeah, she's done a great job with it. Awesome. Uh, just wanted to reiterate town meeting schedule. On uh, March 23rd, we have our joint meeting with the Finance Committee. Um, and then we have a, an additional select board meeting on March 30th to take care of final votes on the warrant with the idea of having it posted on April 12th and the annual town meeting April 27th at 7 p.m. I have two police cruisers that I'm going to request that you declare, declare surplus. Cruiser number 23 is a 2015 Ford Police Interceptor with 162,800 miles. And police cruiser number 20 is a 2014 Ford Police Interceptor with 185,000 miles. Both of those have recently been replaced, but um, we need approval of the board to dispose of them in the best interest of the town. In addition to those two vehicles, we have two V plows from the late 60s, early 70s vintage, and a metal dumpster that was left at the transfer station. Um, so I'd like to request permission to dispose of those. Do you need a motion? I do. Question. Can you go ahead, Jerry? 
Yeah, I just, uh, out of curiosity, how do you d dispose of the uh, vehicles? D do they go to auction or do they get um, destroyed? We, we've done all of the above. We, we auction a lot of our equipment and vehicles off and we've been, um, we've gotten much more competitive um, pricing when we, we send them off to public auction versus just doing a bid ourselves. Mm -hmm. um some of the items different things like the the metal dumpster i, I it's not likely we we'll get much for it um if we auctioned it so that's something that would be disposed of by the dpw sometimes they can get um some money for metals and things like that but um one of these vehicles they'd like to use they'd like to use the um i think it's the engine let's see front subframe, the engine and the transmission, right. the transfer case and the front suspension. They'd like to use to um, work on one of the other PD vehicles, but the other one would be disposed of at public auction. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So do you need a motion that would include those various items or do you yes. need to state them again? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to state them. Police cruiser number 23, police cruiser number 20, two V plows from the 60s or 70s, and a metal dumpster left at the transfer station. Motion as read to declare those items surplus. Se second. Any discussion? A roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Gary Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby, yes. Um, in terms of 19 Independence Way, I just wanted to provide a brief update. They, um, our consultants, Ransom Environmental, are continuing to sample grand, uh, groundwater in March and April, and they're hoping that the site will be closed in May and that we'll be able to move forward at that point with uh, closing with the successful um, auction. Uh, participant. Uh, and I just wanted to follow up on Leslie Matthews' question from earlier. I think Chief Lucy gave you all the details that I learned in the meeting, but that, that meeting last week that she referenced was mayors, managers, and uh, health directors. And basically, we were just discussing all of the logistics for the uh, vaccination clinics, the dates, the locations, and then a little bit about cost allocations. Amesbury is the lead community. Um, and we talked a little bit about how we're going to do all the accounting and um, submissions for the CARES, CARES Act reimbursement. So that's it, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Mm -hmm. Okay, under correspondence, we received some letters from the Mass Division of Marine Fisheries regarding commercially restricted shell fishing and in fact, Clamp flat closures due to excessive rainfall on our February 16th, February 28th, and March 1st. We have a save the date for an event. The Town of Newbury Council on Aging Outdoor Coffee and Chat with Town of Newbury Leadership, Thursday, April 22nd, 10.30 a.m. So everyone save the date for that one. Uh, we get a letter fiscal year 22 for the Triton Regional School District budget. Get a newsletter from the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center in Newburyport. And we also received a letter from GUSD Hankston and Company regarding the audit of financial statements for the town of Newbury. Um, do we have any meeting updates? Does anyone have any meeting updates? We had a, a we had an um, old business, the Merrimack Piscataqua River dredge. That okay. was an addition to the um, agenda. Yes. Okay, let's take that up now. Jeff or Tracy, would you want to just bring everyone up to speed? I can probably start that off and Tracy could fill in if she finds that I'm off track. How's that? Um, right. I'll give you a little history of why this is in place. Um, and before I start this history, I really want to thank um, Bruce Tyre and the MRBA for all the things he's accomplished in so many different directions for Plum Island and all the people on Plum Island have actually worked in the direction to try to solve some of the issues that certainly confront Plum Island. And Tracy at our town level, and when Doug was here, 
he was very efficient on the 103, which I'm going to discuss and a few other things that we had to do to move forward. So we had a, a really good team and I'm sure Bill's going to fit the same mold because Plum Island certainly has some issues coming up with certainly some of the things that are befalling it with sea level rise. So real quickly, sand management on Plum Island, especially with the federal navigation project has always been challenging. Absolutely more so in the face of climate change and sea level rise. After the storms of the winter of 2013, it was painfully apparent that we had issues on Plum Island. So we kind of stepped forward and enlisted the use of the Corps of Engineers Section 103 Hurricane and Storm Damage Reduction Project. In fact, I can remember, I, I was chair then, I can remember writing the letter. It was in May 4th, 2017 to Mr. John Canelli, who is the chief of the planning branch of the U.S. Cor uh, Corps of Engineers. And in summary, it read, we request the Corps of Engineers investigate the problems under its hurricane storm damage and reduction program, section 103 of the um, 1962 River and Harbors Act. And this act showed the need and the awareness and the plight of Plum Island and allowed us to step forward and put us in position to be able to accept some of the dredge sand should it come our way. And of course, through the hard work of the MRBA and uh, other folks, you know, we have do two dredge projects that are being bid finalized and coming to fruition. We also realized at this time that the drop zone, which is to the north of kind of Center Island from the groin to the north. We hadn't updated the, um, all the stuff that we have to do through DEP and, and coastal zone and, and fish fish and all that stuff. So through Tracy's hard work, we acquired a CZM permitting grant for the near shore placement zone. And the contract went up to uh, GZM, GZA. And uh, I actually can remember going up with Doug and they did a really great job. So fast forward to this day, and um, with everything kind of queued up, as I, I'm sure people are starting to get aware, and this document kind of shows you, you have an agreement in front of you that is at the request of Bruce of the MIBA and the other participants and the other people involved. And it's really to memorialize everyone's position and understanding where they are in the queue. If you kind of go through the whole document, it lays out the meat and, and it was, as Bruce said, the crafting of it and, um, you know, Cal Corse is still a lawyer and everything else. And Jerry, I'm sure will, will attest to the fact that it's written in such, such a way that like everything is subject to appropriations. So it's not trying to tie you in to a contract. It's just to kind of make sure that no one doesn't really try to change the directions that have been put in place. And that's what the towns have agreed to. And there's certain subgroups within the towns that are trying to maybe break the MRBA up, let's say. And this kind of puts in place where everyone is in this long process that has taken so long to receive the dredge from the Merrimack River and the uh, Portsmouth sand. So. My, my, my request for you guys would be to sign this agreement so that Bruce would have it going forward for the next meeting on the 12th. Uh, I move that we um, Alicia. sign the agreement as requested by Senator Tarr. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, discussion? Gary, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, this is basically saying that um, Newbury is, is going to pay half a million dollars for the, the dredgings, correct? I mean, the, a good way to answer this is if everything goes the way it has gone and the way we hope it's gone and the way we've been planning you know, all the people involved for the last, uh, probably since uh, 2014, if, every, if everything goes the way we want it to go, yeah, we're gonna receive sand 
if we're lucky enough to be placed on the offshore bar at $3 to $4 a foot, mm -hmm. where if that type of placement occurred, it would be in the 40 to, to maybe $60 range. So yeah, if, if we have the luck to be able to have all the stars align, we absolutely will try to, uh, to purchase that sand for offshore placement on the, on the bar. And, and, and at the price tag of half a million dollars, because it, uh, it, it says it, the differential is estimated to be three and four dollars per cubic yard, totaling between 900,000 and 1.2 million. That would be for all the dredges. Our share of the dredge might be 300. It's it, probably going to be 150 cubic yards. Yeah, but yeah, that's, that's, and I mean, I know the, the Merrimack, their dredging is going to Newburyport, correct? From this yes. document. The, the night, the, uh, the, the dredge that's coming out of the Merrimack River, yeah. <clears throat> the mayor put the money in place, which I'm sure she will, will go directly to the uh, North Point project, yes. In Newbury, right. In Newburyport. In Newburyport, yeah. Um, and we, and we're, we expect to do the same for our residents. So, and remember, it's subject to um, to appropriation. If we don't have the money or if we can't do it or the state can't get the 75% reimbursement, then we won't do it. Yeah, well, it's, it's, an awful lot of, it's an awful lot of money. And considering we got this agreement yesterday afternoon without any other input or information, just to be consistent, I'm voting no because you know, without any other information, I don't want to pay half a million dollars for sand. And I mean, is this sand? Is this rocks? Could we have a could we have a sample of what we're buying? That kind of money? I want to know what I'm buying. Am I buying boulders, granite, uh, clay, sand that can be used? Um. The materials that have been determined to be compatible by testing that's been taken. Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong here. Is uh, it actually, it was a good statement. I mean, I have to, I have to deflect to all the engineers and everyone that's been involved in this that know so much more than I do for the, uh, for the product that's like JR said, it's compatible for offshore placement, and especially the, the stuff that's coming out of the Scatterquart because it's a little bit coarser and will stay in place so but i understand jerry i understand if you're not spread your step forward for per mile on this it's fine so Mike, i'm sorry just didn't... quick just quick question yeah, statement. Bruce, when did bruce's email come in yesterday oh that it came, it came in this came in yesterday yeah uh, was... when did we just recently... i thought it was friday wasn't it didn't it come in friday oh yesterday we received it yesterday afternoon the mrba met friday and sent oh. that sometime over the weekend. And uh, it was this, this meeting was, I was at a meeting on Friday and this is when this occurred. This is, um, it's been, this has been in process. I know, like Jeff said, since at least 2014, there have been many, many meetings, many discussions uh, between leaders on the, at the local level, the state level, citizens um, to, I don't like bringing things in late to the agenda. Um, this is a different situation. We are very lucky to have um, Senator Tyra and others working so hard on our behalf. And this is really one of our best opportunities to and I, families on the island. When you look at the number on a piece of paper, you know, it's there's a, there's a good size bill there. Um, but when we look at the amount of families properties we can protect on Plum Island by doing this or at least buy them some time. Um, I feel like it's very well worth doing in all in, in JR, I gotta I gotta establish the fact. Jeff, give me a second please yeah, to go ahead. and kick it around. Um, frankly would be disrespectful oh. to Mr. Tar and other people that have put many, many years and many meetings and so much effort into this. It is a time sensitive thing. Government's a barge taken many years and it's actually coming close to fruition. Um, that's just where I stand. If the board feels it's a better idea to table this or kick it around, that's fine. But um, Well, I, I also just got to, before people get like invested in the fact that it's cast in stone, 
if you really read the last part of it, and it was written that way on absolute perfect, it was done that on purpose. This is all subject to appropriation. It's just to basically memorialize the intent of what we would like to do. Provided, however, that if one community is unable to pay the cost for its equal share of materials, then the other may receive the remaining amount of materials. This is not a binding agreement. So the, it's my understanding that I can remember this from a long time ago. This is all part of that whole dredge process. Jeff, correct me if, if I'm wrong. They were talking about dredging the Piscataqua. They're talking about dredging the Merrimack. They're talking about dredging the, I think it was the Anasquam and the Essex River because it's acknowledged that there is a serious issue on shifting sands um, in this region and that this MB uh, Merrimack uh, River Beach Alliance group that is chaired by Senator Tarr has been working towards this for years. And this is just, and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, is this just um, an administrative thing to keep this process moving forward? Because if the town of Newberry misses this opportunity to protect um, the Newbury side of the island and um, the other communities around us take advantage of this, it's no, I, I'm, I'm not going to be happy. So please don't, Alicia, please don't mistake the concept of dredging rivers because we're lucky enough to have the core to be able to do it. Like Essex might be in line soon for a dredge also you know, as a navigate, navigation, you know, awareness because they shoal in. That's a mm -hmm. separate issue from the fact that these dredges have been online for a long time and Pomylan and houses and water and sewer after 2013, we certainly realized yeah. that if we get a chance to buy a large pot of sand that can be put on an offshore bar to make the waves tip over so they don't run into the shore with the velocity that they have. And we can continue to protect the water and sewer yes. and the homes. If we get that opportunity, yes. we want to position ourselves to be able to take advantage of it if we choose. For instance, when we first entered into this, believe it or not, there was talk that it was going to be zero cost so we certainly moved as quickly as we can. Right now it's setting up to be a very low cost for the sand and the state's gonna pay for 75% of it. Hmm. When I step out on my deck at night, I live on Low Street, I'm a you know, fair ways inland. Um, when the tide's right and the conditions are right, I can hear the ocean eating the beach down there and it's, I'm far away and it's frightening. It, frankly, I, I, I worry for the people along the beach down, concerned about their homes. Um, I know they're in desperate need of some help. They've paid taxes for years and years. I think this is the least we can do for them. I mean, I know at the end of the day, Plum Island might be a losing battle on, you know, 60 years or 100 years or 200 years, but um, they're, they're it, it's, they pay the taxes and I, I, I it's think- still worth fighting for, I'm sorry. Well, I think that was well stated, JR, but I've, I've got to go back to just really kind of state to you guys that this is not made to be a binding contract, no more than the state wants it to be an absolute binding contract. It's subject to appropriations like the state and we can do. It is to keep everyone aware of what their abilities are and their placeholder is. And that's an agreement that Bruce would like to have. If so we we, not to do it, that's yeah, fine. Please. So Jeff, you, when you say subject to appropriation, you're talking about appropriation at, at, at our town meeting for the new or, or any Or anyone, the ability, if we can't pay the money, it's the bottom line reads, then Salisbury could buy the share or Nantasket could buy the share or, right. you know, or they could throw it out to sea and no one will ever get the benefit of it. Right, but if we don't move forward with this, we won't. <clears throat> We're going to miss this ship, right? Oh. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion on the, at least you had a motion on the table, correct? I'll second, I seconded it. Okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, we're in discussion. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, I'll move to a roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? No. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby? Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I, I know you've spent a lot of time, years, years plural at this point, at those MRBA meetings, and you've been right along all along on this and thanks for that Jeff. well i appreciate it from my board because that's one of the very few things bruce has ever asked me to do was to get the agreement well so you know if, if this has been years in the making why didn't somebody call me and let me know <laughs> um i'm sorry jerry if you had questions you should have reached out to i mean did I you did, try to reach I, out to jeff or I the town administrator i did reach out however jeff's name wasn't on this you know if this is so important uh, a phone call would have been appreciated. Did you try to reach the senator's office? No, I didn't. I reached out to some other people that are, are knowledgeable. Are Did they a part of the MRBA? I just got this yesterday afternoon. Okay, and you oh, want, I understand you want that. to vote for, uh, the taxpayers to a uh, half a million dollars for sand? If no, they're not. That's not what we're doing. We're not asking the taxpayers to pay half a million dollars for sale. Well, it hasn't I been to appropriation I yet. Read this. That's the price tag that it stated in this. And I don't think it's, I'm doing my job as a, a selectman to vote on something that I receive in, within 24 hours when it has a price tag of a half a million dollars. And I don't see any language, Jeff. You've mentioned this a couple of times, appropriation. There's nothing about the word appropriation. So, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not comfortable. That's fine. You voted the way, you know, you got to vote your own comfort Jerry, level. Jerry, I, do. I don't want to argue because really, honestly, you have a good point. I mean, Mike's got some history. He kind of, he, he's gone to the MRBA meetings. He's kind of followed all this. You, you really haven't because you're kind of new, but that if one community is unable to pay that's pretty much if appropriate, if funds aren't appropriated, you know, that stuff, it's just meant to be what the outline is meant to be. It's not a binding agreement that the town of Newbury is going to have to pay for that sand. The state doesn't even know if they can get the money to pay for it. They might only get 50% of it. They might get 25% of it. We don't even know what's ahead. It's absolutely not a roadmap for what we have to do. It's signing an agreement that if everything is perfect and all the stars align, that we would be in place to do this. And Jerry, I'm going to apologize to you because it through tonight, didn't we? Well, I, I'm going to apologize to you because when we got this, I think it was yesterday, the thought crossed my mind to call you on it because I wasn't sure if you were aware of all this MRBA stuff. And the day got ahead of me and I said to myself, well, if she, and then at last night, I was like, well, if she's had any questions. I'm sure she would have reached out. So, um, I did, I won't do that I again. Did, I did reach out to what sources I had because I, I certainly, well, never mind. The, it's the vote is done. Well, you didn't reach out to any of the board members. Did you, JR? Did you get a call? None. I had a call. You got a call? Did you explain? Did you explain to her? I explained what I could. Like I said, but I agree. One of the things that I've and I've talked to the chairman about. We this isn't a good example, but we have to get stuff in advance before we just we vote on it. And, and that has been rectified in the last few months. I know. I know. It, but it, it, much better. But I'm just saying, it's like got this it's, it's like, when it's I get before. so when I get something this important from Senator Tar. It's good on the agenda. Yeah, you know, sometimes things come out of left field like this for us, and it's not, you know, I don't like it either, but um, as the executive branch of the government, you kind of got to be able to shift like that. Right. I, and you can't I can't be rigid. And, I don't enjoy getting something late like that. I don't because I know it breaks, it'll break down into the, I didn't ask, let's just table it. I knew, I knew we would end in this, in this, go around, but it's incumbent on all of us to dig in. It's incumbent on all of us to pick up the phone, call each other, call town officials. Call oh, but, then, office but then you say, oh, you violate the open meeting law. You can't ask questions, you know? Actually, I mean, well, you can call the town administrator. Jerry, on something like this, call Tracy, you know? Yeah. 
I, well, we don't want we don't want you to get blindsided all the time if there's a problem. Well, I mean, if you want to vote, call me. Part of the job is digging in, not Actually, just Actually, if, if something like if something like this comes up again was something that I'm pretty much involved in, it didn't really enter my mind like it entered uh, Alicia's. But I'll call you. Yeah, I, I thought I could. I thought I could. I th actually thought I could explain it good enough. I'm disappointed that I didn't, but I thought Jeff, it, you, Jeff you did. You did explain it well enough. <clears throat> that Moving won't happen on. again on my part. Any meeting updates? Mm -hmm. uh, we have meeting minutes, February 9th, 2021. Is there a motion? Motion to move. Second. Roll call vote. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. J.R. Colby? Yes. Uh, we have warrants to sign tonight. Uh, is there a motion to approve warrants? Motion to approve. Second. Uh, Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby? Yes, I need a vote to allow the chair to sign warrants. Motion to let the chair sign the warrants. Second. Lisa Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby? Yes. Uh, we have no executive session tonight. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Okay. Alicia Greco? Yes. Mike Doyle? Yes. Jerry Heavey? Yes. Jeff Walker? Yes. And J.R. Colby? Yes. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Have a good night.